The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has admitted for the first time that contaminated groundwater is seeping from the site into the ocean. The statement comes two weeks after workers recorded a spike in levels of cesium and other substances in monitoring wells near the plant. The first signs of increasing concentrations of radioactive materials were reported in May. In early July, levels of cesium jumped by about 100 times over the space of four days. At the time, officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company said they didn't have enough data to determine if contaminated groundwater was leaking into the ocean. But nuclear regulators contradicted this assessment, saying a leak was highly likely. TEPCO engineers analyzed the levels of groundwater inside monitoring wells between January and July. They concluded that a drop of those levels indicates contaminated water is leaking into the ocean. We sincerely apologize for causing concerns to so many people, particularly those who live in Fukushima. Utility officials say levels of another radioactive substance called tritium have been rising inside the facility's port, but they say the impact of the leak is limited because concentrations of tritium remain low at the port's exit and off the coast. The head of a local fishermen's union says he was shocked to learn the situation is so different from what the utility has been claiming until now. Now, if you ask people in Japan to list the issues that will be on the top of their minds when they go to the polls, many will mention energy policy. The future of nuclear power has been a matter of public debate since 2011 when an accident crippled a plant in Fukushima. Eventually, all of Japan's 50 commercial reactors were offline. Citizens launched demonstrations last year against a decision to restart two units. But since then, the passion for protests has faded. NHK World's Yochiro Tateiwa went to find out why. The aftermath of the 2011 nuclear accident prompted protests after protests against atomic energy and plans to restart idle reactors. Sometimes thousands of people gather, sometimes hundreds of thousands. Tatsuya Yoshioka organized some of the demonstrations. He was thrilled people showed so much passion. More than 60% of the Japanese people, the, especially this uh, civil society opinion, is very strong to, against the nuclear power plants. But month by month, Yoshioka watched their passion fade as people shifted their focus to other issues. Reconstruction from the disaster is much more important than the nuclear issue. Nuclear plants are a complex issue because there are so many points of view. I don't have an instant opinion. I would like to see nuclear power plants restart. Electric bills are too expensive. Yoshioka is trying to reignite a nationwide discussion about the use of nuclear energy. We lose opportunity then really to shift the, our society toward to the nuclear power free. 
Yoshioka says he's frustrated. Japanese seem to have forgotten about the risks nuclear plants pose. Without nuclear power, utility companies are importing more oil and gas. They've started to pass those costs on to their customers. They've been pushing to restart reactors. So have the executives of big corporations. They say Japan needs a stable energy source. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and his ruling Liberal Democratic Party have been making the same argument. They support the nuclear industry, provided it's well regulated. Nuclear power plants that meet new safety requirements shall be restarted in accordance with professional judgment. Leaders of opposition parties all say they want to abolish nuclear energy in the future. But so far, they've failed to present concrete ways of achieving it. The Fukushima accident exposed the risks and the expense associated with nuclear power. But Yoshioka says Japanese have become complacent. Day by day, that uh, the memory of the or impression of the March 11th is uh, going bad. The UTT company have started the process of restarting their nuclear power plants. But we must not let the memories of March 11, 2011 fade. Regardless of our personal views on nuclear energy, it's clear that more debates on how to power the country is essential. Now the Prime Minister Abe has gained the power to push through legislation and to implement policies. The question is, how will he use that power? We got some insight from Ken Hijino, an associate professor at Keio University and an expert on Japanese politics. <laughs> So last night's election result completes the LDP's return to power. It now has control of both chambers of the Diet, which means that this problem of Diet twist, in which the ruling party only controls one of the houses, resulting in legislative gridlock, is resolved. At the same time, uh, the LDP has become a very large power, and they're safely in power in a sense. And this may create the risk of infaction uh, infighting and factionalism, which has tended to harm the LDP historically. If Abe -san, uh, Prime Minister Abe is serious about growing, he will also have to, in, he will also have to invest uh, in educating the workforce, uh, education and also getting women to enter the workforce and stay in the workforce. Um, it's often said that Japan's most underused resource or asset is women. If they're serious about long-term growth, then one has to educate the workforce to be able to deal with a new uh, economic environment. Um, so where is the Abe administration spending on? Um, actually, they're spending quite a lot on public works. It's not quite clear whether all that spending is done in the most efficient manner. Uh, as you may know, LDP in the 80s and 90s was notorious for spending on public works, so-called uh, bridges to nowhere, highways to nowhere. If that sort of thing is, were to be repeated, um, although Prime Minister Abe said the LDP is new now, it has, it's a new reformist party, um, there will be a lot of doubts. <laughs> TPP is always discussed or usually discussed in the context of free trade, improving economies, structural reforms, but it has a lot to do with the security architecture in the region. Um, by creating a network a camp of free market liberal democracies through TPP. Uh, I think the intention of the U.S. is to try and engage China, China come into the TPP as well, ultimately. If so, if the Abe administration, because of backbench, backbench resistance, resistance from rank and file, fails to enter the TPP, this will not be uh, damaging just to Japan's economic reform prospects, but also to its security prospects. Ken Hijino, Associate Professor at Keio University.
The operators of four Japanese power companies are trying to get idle nuclear plants up and running again. They've held their first meetings with regulators in charge of screening applications to restart the facilities. The utilities are seeking approval to fire up a total of 12 reactors under new safety standards that took effect last week. Two of those reactors are at Kyushu Electric Sendai plant in Kagoshima. Kyushu Electric officials told members of the Nuclear Regulation Authority about new safety measures at the plant. They discussed preparations for earthquakes and tsunami waves and explained plans for a temporary command center for emergencies. The Sendai plant is near several active volcanoes. Regulators said they need to check whether the plant would be vulnerable in the event of an eruption. Representatives from Hokkaido, Shikoku and Kansai Electric also explained the steps they have taken to increase safety at their facilities. Japanese investigators are taking a closer look at several of the nation's nuclear plants. They're trying to find out if the land beneath them is prone to earthquakes. A team of experts appointed by the Nuclear Regulation Authority is investigating the Monju plant near the Sea of Japan. The fast breeder reactor is designed to generate power using plutonium from spent nuclear fuel. It's currently idle. Monju sits about eight geological faults. Investigators are trying to determine if any of them are active. If they are, regulators won't allow the facility to restart. The team began looking at an area where part of a fault is visible in the ground. They scraped the soil to get a better view. The Monju plant reached criticality in 1994, but shortly after that, a series of accidents and technical problems forced operators to take it offline. The facility has been mostly idle since then. Regulators have ordered investigations into five other nuclear facilities. In May, they determined that a fault beneath the Tsuruga plant is active. A group of protesters in southern China has taken on big business and won. They've succeeded in getting a local government in Guangdong province to drop plans to build a nuclear fuel processing plant. Officials in Jiangmen City have announced that they will not approve an application for the project. More than 1,000 people rallied against the plan on Friday in front of the local government office. Earlier this month, the authorities announced that a state-run corporation would build a nuclear fuel processing facility about 30 kilometers from the city center. The protesters said an accident at the facility could lead to widespread radioactive contamination. India's Supreme Court may have given the final nod to the commissioning of the country's largest power plant, but the move hasn't come. The scandal surrounding it. The station has split locals into those who um, can't claim it's crucial for the economy and those insisting it's a major health hazard. Artis Alexey Rashevsky has been investigating what's driving the anti-nuclear camp. 
This may have seemed as a minor peaceful protest, but it seriously stalled one of India's most ambitious projects. The first energy block of the Kudankulam nuclear power station, destined to solve a growing electricity problem for millions, was due to be launched in 2011. But because of these fishermen protesting against what they see as an environmental threat, India's High Court refused to give the go-ahead for the station to start working. However, protesters were forced to declare they were acting in good faith with no foreign financing. A small amount of money that we need comes from our own people. The fishermen contribute a part of their catch every once in two weeks. But not everyone quite bought that. India's Prime Minister accused Western states of derailing India's nuclear program. The atomic energy program has gotten into difficulties because these NGOs, mostly I think based in the US, don't appreciate the need for our country to increase energy. This protest is not a one-off. Rallies organized by non-governmental organizations targeted other projects in India. Mining was also hit by unrest, leading to multi-million dollar losses and severely hampering development. NGOs provoke the local tribal or people who are in the interior that these people are coming to extract your resources and they will take it away and you will not be given anything. You will all be deprived of all these things. After, once they provoke them, then they organize demonstrations. U.S. officials have been staunchly denying all allegations that Washington had a hand in stalling projects in India. But experts say this has been a tactic employed by the State Department for more than a quarter of a century. Uh, so the State Department and the Agency for International Development spends uh, hundreds of millions of dollars each year to fund a series of NGOs which are, they're not non-governmental organizations, they appear as that, for organizations that supposedly promote democracy. That's their official line. These NGOs really are the tip of the iceberg, or very often they are a visible portion of a larger agenda of the United States and of the Western powers or of transnational elites. He is going to follow the same patterns that we've seen um, uh, elsewhere around the world with this NGOization. But the Indian leadership is clearly concerned about these prospects. The last known data on the financing of Indian NGOs was published in 2011. Back then the government established that 22,000 organizations had received a total of more than $2 billion coming from abroad, 650 million of which allegedly came from the United States. This year New Delhi has yet to publish such a report, but government sources claim that nowadays this funding has dwindled to almost nothing. The bank accounts of more than 700 such organizations have been frozen and legislation against foreign agent activities has been toughened. And while activists bristle over what they believe to be a suppression of freedoms in the country often described as the world's most populous democracy, India's economists say that numerous vital projects, including the Kudankulam nuclear power station, will now get the green light. Alexei Roshevsky, RT. Now in France, a nuclear plant security is becoming an issue. Anti-nuclear activists have broken into a plant and demanded its closure. The country derives around 75% of its power from nuclear energy. 29 members of Greenpeace used a ladder to climb over a wall of the Trikistan plant. The activists displayed an anti-nuclear banner. Greenpeace said that it only took the group 15 minutes to enter and that the action exposed security flaws. The group called for the plant's immediate closure because they say some of the reactors are cracked. Police arrested the protesters. The French government says that it has asked the plant's operator for details on the breach. Government officials say they are considering tougher penalties for intruders into reactor sites. Activists have launched a series of entries into France's nuclear plants. They've stepped up their campaign since the accident at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi plant in 2011. A Japanese manufacturer is being blamed for supplying faulty nuclear power components to a U.S. utility and failing to fix them. Officials from Southern California Edison say they have sent a demand for compensation to Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. They say defective steam generators forced the closure of their nuclear plant. The San Onofre plant suspended operations in January last year following the discovery of excessive wear in the pipes of the generators. The operator decided last month to shut down the plant for good, judging it would never be profitable. The letter says Mitsubishi was supposed to make repairs immediately but failed to do so. 
It says this was a grave breach of contract. Officials from the utility did not mention the size of damages they are seeking. They say they will record a loss of about $450 million to $650 million due to the closure of the plant. Notice how weird it starts to get when you just stop breathing?
Victims of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster are school children. About 160 children who were forced to flee their hometown have held an event to mark the end of their school term. The students were evacuated from Okuma town to Aizu Akamatsu city some 100 kilometers away. Their former home now stands within the restricted zone around the stricken plant. During the ceremony, students looked at photos of events held during the term, including a concert of Japanese music staged to lift their spirits. A school official told the children they, would, uh, they should always feel a sense of gratitude for the support they are receiving. Around 160 students from Okuma town are enrolled here, about 75 percent fewer than attended their old schools before the disaster. I will miss seeing my friends, but I will make new friends at the new school. Enrollment is expected to fall even further as families attempt to rebuild their lives in new communities. Some of the most vulnerable victims